Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. On this edition of Minnesota Original, two-time champions of the National Poetry Slam, members of St. Paul's competitive spoken word poetry team present excerpts from their work. Renowned soprano Maria Jetty rehearses with the Lyra Baroque Orchestra in a new performance space for early music, the Baroque Room. These country rockers pride themselves as being loud, loose, and a little cranky. The Tex Pistols Band performs. These artists and more, now on Minnesota Original. My name is Kyle, my stage name is Guante. My name is Kari Jackson. I'm Karakowski, and I am a slam poet. The title of this poem is Reach, and that is written in all capital letters. The name of this poem is Bridalplasty. This poem is called An Open Letter from the Brothers Grimm to Walt Disney. One. On the first day of school, we make a list of the characteristics of a good poet. But see, this is not a poem about poetry. So your little girl will wonder why no pictures of you exist before your wedding. You will never have the right to call her pretty. And what if she is devastatingly so? We have come to lay claim to your children. Every child raised on your cotton candy dinners, your insipid treatises on the magic of the world, they will have you to thank when they sprout into adults still trembling from the dark. And spare us your assertion that <laughs> well, a poetry slam is both an art and a sport. It is performance poetry done in a competitive format. Poetry that you write with the intent to, to express out loud to an audience. So it's a little bit of poetry, a little bit of stand-up comedy, a little bit of rhetoric, a little bit of hip-hop possibly, a little bit of like all these different vocal forms, a lot of theater too, actually. All these different vocal forms kind of mashed together. Don't paint my house white and tell me it's heaven. Don't bring me a sack of beans and tell me they're magic. Bring me magic paint. Every inch of our body's heaven on the first day of school. Do not make a list of the characteristics of a good poet. Make a list of the people who will weep when you die. Seven, we are speedometers. We are remote controls. We are dollars in tip jars and dive bars. We've seen what they have to offer. It's great. It's beautiful, and it is not nearly enough. There are very few rules in Poetry Slam. It's just you and the microphone and the audience. Can't bring a flute. There's no music, no props, no other people on stage, and it's a very like raw, naked art form. The idea is just to see what a person can do on a stage in front of people without any stuff. There's, there's no rush like that. You know, I've played sports for a long time, and like there's no rush like killing a poem. You are timed three minutes and 10 seconds. Because face it, no one wants to sit through a six minute poem, especially if it's mediocre. We are judged by a panel of, of five randomly selected audience members. Most of which who have never even heard a slam poem before in their lives. They are scored in Olympic scoring 0.0 to 10.0 based on originality, content, uh, the performance, whatever the audience member who happens to be judging that day chooses to judge them on. I personally don't write for a slam audience. I write for myself, and if the audience loves it, then they love it, and if they don't, they don't. If you feel like the room is pretty dead, you have a poem that can wake them up and get them going, you're gonna do it, and if it works out, it'll probably improve the show, and you'll get good points, everybody wins. We abhor that your children now believe a frog became a prince through the kindness of a kiss. The girl hurled the frog into a wall, and that, you see, is a real kiss. Have you felt it? Have you ever been filled with the joy that offered to tear you in two? The little mermaid knew of such a joy, yet you bathe her in lies. Your so-called Ariel does not get the prince. She dies. The seven dwarfs did not bear their own names. Perhaps you'd understand if you lived in a society built on the graves of peasants. They lived and die nameless, like midwives and infantry, the oral tradition itself. Or if it's the other way, if it's a bunch of fun stuff. This poem is called Her Name. And no one's had their heart broken yet. Maybe you're the one to do it. So you gotta read the room, be sensitive to what's going on. 
one night before supper, I tried to say grace and couldn't finish. Our Father, who art in... Who art in... I knew the word. I knew the word. I could feel it. I could see it. It was sitting across the table from me, sitting there staring at me with those eyes that got no business looking that sad, that daisy woman dripping petals down them precious cheeks, and all I could say was, please, please, Lord, give me back her name. One of the, the, the most beautiful things about spoken word is that it allows you to tell the story of either yourself or people you know when those stories don't always get told. I think people appreciate hearing feelings or ideas or experiences that they've had expressed in an elegant way that they can go, you know, that's what I've been trying to say for years and now I can point my friends to this poem if they ask me about it. Did you not respect him enough for finding you beautiful? If he hates the way his body feels next to the cool touch of a mannequin, will you leave him for a man who believes women look better in photographs? The first time my lover caressed my stomach, my body recoiled. I wanted to break his wrist, clear off his arm, begged him to leave that strip of skin barren and unnoticed. He said he would not. Pressed each fingertip tight to my flesh, they whispered into me, you have ten new reasons to love yourself completely. Poetry Slam is different. Incredibly inspiring. Random. L humbling, almost. Oh, I don't think one adjective could grab all of what Poetry Slam is because one of the essences of Poetry Slam is its diversity. Uplifting, yeah. I, I would say diversity. Introduces poetry in a way that I don't believe people have heard poetry before. Diversity in the type of poetry you're going to hear, the way it's delivered, the, the people delivering it. Because the whole idea is that anybody can walk in. And a fundamental tenet of slam poetry is that everybody has a story. A homeless dude could come in, win a poetry slam. It doesn't matter what your socioeconomic background is, what your cultural background, what your religious background, there is a place for you where you're not only welcomed, but embraced. Building something that, that transcends the way that we're always segregated, whether you know by neighborhood, race, ethnicity, class, all these different things, like pushing everyone together and being like, everyone has a story. What's your story? Let's, let's talk about it. Let's listen to it. Understand, they will never understand this. The beauty of a parking lot at twilight, how the sky Burns blue, the sweetness of every second when the big hand is on the 11, the smile of the pretty girl who actually looks at you. We betray ourselves for $7 an hour. Our native language is white noise, cart pushers, cashiers, janitors. We are an army fighting a war we don't believe in in a country whose name we can't pronounce, but we're fighting. And we're tired, but we're fighting. And we're losing but we're fighting. The National Poetry Slam is the world's largest annual Poetry Slam event and brings up to 84 teams of poets from around the world together to compete and see who's the best, and we're now the best twice in a row. Poetry Slam democratizes poetry. It says that you don't have to have a, a, an MA to know what poetry is. You don't have to be a grad student. Poetry is for everybody. Poetry, once upon a time, was taken out of the hands of the peasants and given to the elite only who were educated and could read and write. And that's when it became a written art form. Before that, it was an oral tradition. We've brought it back to an oral tradition now. We're just people that live in this crazy country. and We write about what we experience. You don't need a gallery, you don't need a museum, you don't need an auditorium. You can just go out in the street and create your art for the world, and that's beautiful and rare. one of my favorite pictures that I've ever made at the state fair. I went to the cattle auction, and I had been to the cattle auction, which is on the last day of the fair, other years. But this particular year, Ronald McDonald was there. And I, I started shaking, I was so excited. I'm like, oh my God, Ronald McDonald at the cattle auction? I just know a picture's gonna happen today. And so I just kept following Ronald and I waited and waited and shot some pictures and then this one moment came together. 
I just love that Ronald's kind of just subtly back there with this poor kid who, you know, it's, it's, it's very emotional for these kids who have raised these animals from the time they were first born. And now they're auctioning them off. And if I were the type to put little bubbles in my pictures, which I'm not, but I, all I could think of when I look at this is like, mmm, hamburgers. My name is Tommy Morris. I'm a harpsichordist as part of a Baroque chamber group called Flying Forms. And my name is Mark Levine. I play Baroque violin in Flying Forms. We're a husband and wife a duo. Early music means music written before 1750. That includes the Baroque period, but then before that, Renaissance and Medieval. It's kind of a general term for what we do, which is performance practice, and that's probably the better term because we play music the best we can the way that we think they played it during the Baroque time. Also, we play on instruments that are built to the specifications of the Baroque period, which is 1600 to 1750. So I play a harpsichord, which is a copy of an instrument around from the late Baroque, a 1750 instrument. And Mark plays a Baroque violin, which is made to the specifications of, of the times. The big differences in, uh, between a Baroque violin and a modern violin um, are a lot of minor things that add up to make a different sound. The neck of the instrument is a little shorter and a little thicker. The fingerboard is shorter. There's no chin rest. The bass bar and some of the wood inside the instrument, uh, there's simply less of it. The strings are made of gut. The largest differences are that Baroque bows are, tend to be shorter. And the most important thing is they have a concave curve where a modern bow has a convex curve this direction, and it completely changes the dynamic of where you place your weight and how you make sound. We are recent additions to the Twin Cities, um, and we came here partially because there's a great music community here in town. And what we found is there are a lot of early music groups in town. There's a Lira Broke Orchestra, there are a lot of smaller groups as well. We've opened up a new uh, performance space called the Baroque Room, and it's for any chamber music, but the idea is that it will specialize in early music. It's located in a Lower Town in downtown St. Paul, at the corner of 4th and Wall. It's right next to the Farmer's Market. I'm Maria Jetty. I'm a singer. I live in the Twin Cities and sing all kinds of music, but uh, one of my absolute favorites is early music, especially music of the Baroque. The Lyra Baroque Orchestra started as the Lyra Concert. Lyra, I would say, is probably the, 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 the one Baroque orchestra in the Midwest, the, the only one before you get all the way out to San Francisco. They have a, a really devoted following, which I feel has been expanding over the last few years, but I don't think that people realize what a jewel is right here in their community, what great players they are and what fascinating music they're doing. Early music in the Twin Cities has, in the last maybe 10 years, kind of like a, like a little hermit crab, sort of retreated um, sort of non-voluntarily into much more of a niche than it should have here. I, I feel that, that they are the, a sadly neglected treasure, and I hope that in, in the, the next few years, especially now that we have this wonderful room, the Baroque room, that Flying Forms has put together, I have a feeling that this is going to be a, a, a real impetus for, for folks interested in early music, that this will serve as a magnet for, for the early music uh, folks here to come to and, and kind of help the movement burgeon. So I, I'm guessing that this is kind of a germ of a, of a great new life for Lyra and the early music community in the Twin Cities.
When it comes to how I execute work and my style, I really like spontaneous ideas that, that are conceptually strong. And then um, once I have that idea, I really like to try to help it realize itself by giving it the most perfect and appropriate execution that it can have. And I think that's why I work in so many different mediums because not every medium is appropriate for every idea. One of the things I try to do is observe something that seems uh, seemingly mundane and hopefully make something interesting out of that or, or, or extract the creative potential from that object. You know, I don't know why, but I love everything uh, what is small, I mean, uh, in art. Uh, that's why I do uh, these miniatures. In poetry, I like um, haiku. In sculpture, I like small uh, sculptures. And, uh, maybe just part of my nature. Everything what is small. I'm a freelance graphic artist, and mostly I do uh, printmaking. Uh, to be correct, uh, to be right, it's, mm, I do book plates. And uh, book plates are there, democratic art. Uh, you can do everything. It might be portraits, still life, animals, composition of fonts. So, actually, no limits on what you do. Book plates now are considered miniature prints. They tend to, to dominate that, that category within printmaking. They're generally pasted right inside the front cover of a book, and they will depict or illustrate ideas of, of, of the owner, hobbies, interests, and all of that kind of thing. And they almost always have the words ex libris in them, which is Latin for from the library of. What I like in book plate, um, everything is done by my hand, by my mind. It's a little harder, of course, uh, doing a book plate uh, by hand, and maybe easier uh, working on a computer. You can do um, finer, nicer work, but uh, I am artist, I am printmaker, I am um, engraver. I do you know, this engraving under a video camera and the uh, um, image is transferred to screen so that I can see much, much better. And uh, uh, this closed circuit TV has a few functions like uh, black and white. So I use only black and white, it's easy for me. And uh, some option like a contrast, zoom in, zoom out, some great equipment for me. Otherwise, I don't know what could I do? And because first I started when I um, was living in Kazakhstan in 1985. My first uh, friends, they were from Russia, Ukraine, and after a while, maybe just a few months, um, I started uh, getting letters from uh, Bulgaria, Poland, uh, and Italy. Uh, that's why I um, had many friends, and uh, so I did book plates for Japanese collectors, ch um, ch Chinese, Italian, uh, Portuguese, um, many, many. Sarik's work uh, in the grander scheme of, of the engraving world um, 
He's very unique. He fits within uh, Ukrainian and Soviet traditions, but also um, with the Japanese. There is a sense of um, surrealism and a fantasy that is in Japanese engraving that you don't find in a lot of other um, places. I mean, obviously you'll find bits here and there, but I, I feel like Sirik's work really does relate to that as well. It's real art because, you know, uh, artists, uh, they uh, put uh, the same amount of uh, time, you know, power, soul, creating a small miniature. I try to depict and show some part of that um, person. I do book plate for and uh, it's like a reflection of his soul. So uh, I like it very much. That's why you know, it's very alive art.
Minnesota original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.